Hello. Hi, how are you guys? We're good, thank you. Uh, how are you? Still here. We're still here. <laughs> awesome. We're still alive and kicking. So you are going to talk about building a personalization program from zero. Yes, I am. Let me pull up my slide deck. Let's see. Looks like it's coming through. We good to go? Yes, let's go. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm very glad to be here today talking to you about building a personalization program for zero, from zero. Um, I'm Emily Benoit. I manage the lifecycle engagement program at Instride. And when I say from zero, I mean that there is a way you can craft tailored emails for your users with any budget, with any amount of resources or headcount. And we're going to get into that. And the reason that I love talking about personalization um, is partly because my current company in Stride, we're a public benefit company. So we design industry and role-based education programs for workforces. And that means that our corporate partners, the B2B side of the business, are paying for education for their employees, the B2C side. Um, and that makes for a really diverse audience. You know, we've got partners, employees, and working adults across industries with really rich backgrounds on, you know, education history, current finances and work schedules, career needs. Um, and that makes for a super diverse user base. But if you're watching this session, you probably already know that personalization is important for just about every company out there. Uh, it's been a key tactic, talking point, webinar topic for years. You know, it is so ubiquitous that 71% of customers expect personalized interactions from brands. And interestingly, 71% is also the number of CMOs who don't think they have enough budget to execute their strategy. So that means that we as email marketers have really high demands on us, but probably not enough resources. And so this presentation is going to cover how you can start your personalization program regardless of where you are. And so when I'm thinking about a personalization framework, I like to break it into four areas, four stages that kind of escalate in complexity. So you can start with brand-based personalization, layer in some identity features, move to behavior, and then finally have a full-scale program with affinity-based personalization. And so my company in Stride is EdTech very niche, very specific use case. Since we've got a good diverse audience here, let's get a little more global. We're gonna build from the ground up. And since it's spring here in the Northern hemisphere, um, today I'm gonna to pretend that my company is a seed company. My customers are farmers because we all eat. Um, so yeah, welcome to my company, Green Seeds, and we're gonna dive on in. The first step of personalization I like is brand-based. And so this means that you're establishing yourself with assets immediately identifiable and unique to your company. Now, you may be thinking, hold up, this is not what I expect from personalization. You're just telling me to do something across my strategy um, that is not at all tailored to the user. That's why this is step one. You're building a really solid foundation. Personalization doesn't have to be granular to the literal individual. The entire point why you're bringing personalization to your strategy is to be relevant. You want to earn that place in your users' inboxes on their phones. And so for me as a seed company, I know my farmers need seeds. Telling them that is boring, doesn't add any value. There's no reason why they should listen to me. Instead, I need to add some brand-based personalization. What is unique about green seeds? Why should they be excited to hear from me specifically? And so I'm going to layer in creative tone and personality so I'm recognizable and building that personal relationship with them. So my green seeds company, we're gonna be known as smart, reliable, and honest. And we're gonna make sure that that is reflected in every single email that we send. Localization is also a really powerful way to add in personalization, especially if you can target a few different areas. 
So let's say my company is based where I am in real life. So it's going to be a company out of the United States. And we know that most of our audience is in the Midwest because we focus on those native and heirloom seeds. So what can I bring into my emails to make the users feel at home, to make them understand that we are part of the same community and I understand their specific needs? So as a for instance, I know that in the Midwest, our home gardeners know that it is time to start planting, get their spring gardens going when it's Mother's Day. Everyone takes that Sunday to put their seeds and their starts in the ground. So how can I use that localized custom information in my brand-based marketing? Um, can I tell my farmers you know, now in March to make sure that they're buying their flower seeds, make sure that they have their petunias ready to go in May. So I'm adding value and speaking to their personal needs. And the idea here is to serve your masses, you know, have a comprehensive program that makes you really identifiable and already start to build out that relationship. And that's something that you can do without any special tools. The only cost here is your labor hours, you know, your brainstorming and creativity. And so once you've established your brand, this is where we get into the individual user-based personalization. So stage two is gonna be identity-based. This is where you'll gather and use your zero-party data. And that zero-party data is data that your customers are raising their hands and telling you about themselves. And this is a really important opportunity for you to build trust. If you're asking your users for data, they should know that it will be used wisely and quickly. Um, so this is where it's an advantage to start small. You want to make sure that you're only gathering the information that you can turn right around into columns and you're using their time wisely. Every time you ask users for information, that's a little bit of investment of their time. So how do you make that an immediate return? And so this is a great time to collect basic facts, you know, preferred name, if it's relevant to your product, age, location, gender. This is also a great time for surveys and quizzes where you're getting personal preferences. And this can look like data that's in the email body itself, you know, subject line and intro personalization. Again, that makes sense for your user base, um, as well as segmentation. Who should be getting more emails in March versus April? Who prefers email and who prefers SMS? And so let's go back to my green seeds company. What do I need to know immediately about my farmers that they can tell me in less than five minutes, maybe even less than two? So I'm gonna get them to sign up for my newsletter and ask just a few questions. I wanna know their first name to build that relationship. I wanna know their location, the product types they need for my business. And then I'll just have a tick box of a few values that are important to them. So from just that quick lead gen, I can now know about an individual. So let's say I've got one farmer, Sadie, who is really similar to a lot of users in my database. I know that she farms about 50 miles from a couple of major cities. I know that she grows for restaurants and farmers markets, but does not have an on-site farm shop, CSA, or subscription. I know that she grows produce but doesn't work with animals and that it's really important for her to be able to offer interesting varieties of the produce. That's how she remains a profitable business. So from this, I know that Sadie is busy on Saturdays and Sundays. She's at the farmer's market. She's delivering to restaurants. I should not be emailing her to place a seed order on those days. I can start to adjust frequency and timing. I can make sure that the products I'm sharing with her and my emails are relevant, you know, more pumpkin and zucchini seeds. She doesn't need the alfalfa seeds for the chickens and the bunnies. So with this, we've now got an open channel of communication and Sadie sees the immediate value in providing this information back to me. And then now that I've started to build my personalization program, I can expand to first party behavior data. So this is where you can get really robust with recommended products, resources, and you can still start with pretty limited resources and funding of your own by building manually. So I already know who the Sadies at my company are. I've got some basic information that they told me. 
how can I enhance their experience with conversion and purchase data, as well as browse behavior? Um, browse behavior is something that I think a lot of marketers are missing out on because they're so focused on that end stage product. So how can commonly viewed pages, time engaged on your website, and really importantly, clicks and opens in your email and SMS campaigns add value? And so we're gonna, we're gonna keep working with Sadie to enhance her personalization experience. Last week, Farmer Sadie bought a variety of pepper seeds. Now I know as the company that this is a slow germinating summer plant. I also know about Sadie's preferences she told me about and that in addition to buying these products, she read an article on our website about how to stage your market table with a lot of color. So I'm gonna take a look at my most popular products. At this point, I still have pretty limited resources as an email marketer. No fancy tools to dynamically pull in the products for me. So I'm gonna start with about three to five products and manually build out the creative and the campaigns for them. So since I know that Sadie still has some time left in her growing season, I know she values showy colors and interesting products, and I know that she shopped with us before, I'm going to recommend one of our most popular products. Let's say we serve Sadie up a purple green bean in next month's newsletter. Because it's already a popular product for us, and because we have a lot of farmers like Sadie, it's worth the time to build out this creative manually. And we'll do the same thing with our other farmer types. We're going to serve the right people pumpkins and zucchinis. And as we grow out the program, we can keep expanding who qualifies for each audience and add in more products. Maybe that's manually, or maybe as we talk later about getting buy-in from your company, you can invest in those tools where you have a product data feed that pulls in every single SKU you offer, pulls in the prices, the links, the pictures. So just start with those strong individual representatives of your company and then expand from there. And that idea of starting with an individual and expanding brings us to what my opinion is the juiciest area of personalization. This is going to be your affinity-based personalizing. You know some of your users really well. So our farmer Sadies are thriving. So are our Patricks and Marias and Jans, whoever your representatives of your users are. Because we know who they are and what they need, at this point, you're ready to extrapolate your successes with them. And you're gonna apply those successes and the creative you're using to users who are really unknown and mysterious. This affinity-based personalization lets you use tiny amounts of data, you know, that initial landing on your website, a single email open, or even the type they subscribe to, and make big assumptions from that. And you'll be able to do that by doing a combo platter of your identity and behavior-based trends to have a holistic picture. And when you combine that persona with some more advanced tagging on your products, whether that's a physical product, a service, whatever your business requires, you can have that matching. And this is the opportunity to advocate for your team, get as much budget and resources as you can and begin to shop around for tools. So for years, there have been tools that will utilize machine learning and algorithms to bring in product recommendations based on those combo platters that you build. And now we live in that very exciting time where there are artificial intelligence tools as well coming on the scene. And so those will let you take a step even further back and work from less data and be more accurate with the recommendations. It's all going back to those if-then flows. You know, if my user buys a pumpkin, then serve them this product next. Um, these tools will also improve the scalability of your recommendations. When you're working with less data and being more accurate, you can launch more campaigns and get more fine-tuned in the background. Um, what I like about affinity-based marketing is beyond product recommendations, it's also a great time to really flesh out the relationship with your user. So share user testimonials and stats that you know are gonna be relevant to these brand new or long time lapsed people because you've identified those smaller sub communities inside your business. 
and those subcommunities will have an expanded audience size and be even more sophisticated in a much more scalable way. Um, again, this is this is your prime area for return on investment in a personalization program and to really get those fancy schmancy tools. And so one of the best ways to get to the point where you have, you're already in the affinity stage, you've done an amazing job. You probably got there because you thought ahead. You know, we're starting our personalization program from zero here. So on day zero, before you even start plugging first name into the subject line, putting out those surveys, I want you to take a beat and map out the ideal scenarios. So instead of making a wish list of tools and data points, tell the story of what you want to accomplish. So for my company, Green Seeds, what I want is not just more purchases. Of course, I want that. We all have KPIs. But I want my farmers to not have to think as much about the admin of their jobs. I know that they're you know, overworked, underpaid, and that they're happiest when they're either outside or working with their customers. So my role is to make sure that they never again have to think about when to order seeds, how much, what product types. I want them to not have to think about what's going to be the latest on the market and what's going to be the most reliable. And so with that chief story in mind, that's how I'm going to map out what I want my personalization to accomplish. Um, and then you get into the fun stuff, brainstorming ideas. Many email marketers are on teams of one, but odds are there are other folks at your company who are just as invested in this story as you are. So you share that story and bring them together to brainstorm. Don't worry about the can we do it, just put it all out there. Edit it down some, you know, take your expertise and knock out what can and can't be accomplished and then brainstorm again with those more focused categories. Keep ideas in the backlog, as many as possible. So when it comes time to actually start implementing your ideas, um, I definitely advise that you don't just work from a high, medium, low priority. Don't take just the ideas that are gonna have the biggest return on investment and move, put those all toward the top of the list. Instead with personalization, think about it in those four stages, you know, brand, identity, behavior, affinity, and figure out what common pieces of information you have within those ideas. So do you have a cluster of brainstormed ideas that you can accomplish by having a newsletter sign up or by having a single survey? And even if one of them only has 1% you know, uplift on click rate, the other one might have a 10% uplift on conversions and you can launch them at the same time versus having to wait for months for a single tool or more sophisticated platform to be stood up. Um, and then, once you have your starting plans, just document your data schema over and over again. And so what this means is that even before you have your tools, before your funding, you're preparing yourself for the future. This is also going to make you best friends with your product and dev teams, whoever those folks are, because you'll be returning with fewer edits to the requirements and have a game plan. Um, the most important thing to keep in mind is what data from your personalization program do you need to be event-based? So what should be tied to a moment in time, a purchase, a page view, versus what needs to be user-based? So that's data points that should always be on your user profiles and that you have the ability to bring in segment on at any stage in the user funnel. And that's going to be really custom to your business. So go back to your brainstormed ideas and your stories and think about what do I need now versus later. Um, as you're documenting your schema, just be mindful of the different data types. If these data types, string, boolean, object array, are new to you, this is a great professional development opportunity. So go through everything you want to know and think to yourself, do I need this to be text-based? Do I need this to be a number so I can manipulate it as currency or add it together for lifetime value or frequency? Um, again, this is a really good collaboration opportunity with other departments, so you make sure that you're set up for years to come. And then the final data schema piece that I would encourage you to think ahead on is relational data. This won't apply to every single company. So my real life company, Instride, um, 
as you know, corporate sponsored ed tech, we have our employees, our learners as the main user base, but we also communicate with their managers. And so we need to identify the key piece of information that's going to link these two because most ESPs will treat users as a completely siloed individual. There's not a lot of sharing between them. And so your workaround will be that identifier. Maybe you have a literal parent-child relationship in your data. Do you need some sort of family ID so you know that the family as a whole has this many members and these kinds of preferences? So plan ahead on that because it's going to be much harder to add it after the fact. So once you have a game plan, you're going to operationalize your data, get it ready to ship, get to actually using it. Um, for a lot of folks, this can be the intimidating part because this goes from you know, marketing and strategy to more of the operations, the tech side of things. Um, the really good news is that this can also be accomplished from zero, from any budget level. So you can start with super manual personalization literal list uploads of information. This can be tedious, it's annoying, I'm not gonna say it's not, but think about the data pieces that you can get from your users today that will still be relevant to them weeks, months, years from now. The likelihood of my farmers' names, the product types they sell to their customers changing in the next year is super low. So is it worth it for me to take that sheet of newsletter signups I got at the farmer's market input it into a spreadsheet and upload it. You know, I think it does because that means I can have those data pieces across all of my campaigns and the data will still be relevant. Manually, you can also hand build multiple campaigns within a tactic. So let's say I wanna have a Mother's Day series, but I know that my different users are gonna have different needs. Ideally, my ESP will let me serve those books dynamically. I can build out segments within a single send and make it fast. But if that's not the case for you today, literally build out three different emails, you know, one for those folks who are going to be selling seed starts, one for those folks who are going to be selling flowers, one for those folks who are going to be selling food for dinner. And take the time to serve those users and record the results. As you get more sophisticated, it gets easier and things get a little more powerful. So maybe your ESP doesn't just have audiences, but it also saves user fields as merge tags. So you can bring things like first name, location, favorite product into the body of the email. Ideally, it will have dynamic content languages that you can use to serve different creative within a campaign. So this is where that if else logic is gonna be really universal and you're gonna be so glad that you mapped out all of your data and brainstormed ideas because you can have everything exist in a single template. And then once you're ready to really take advantage of your behavior and affinity-based marketing, that's where you're going to get into those third-party connectors. So a customer data platform is a really nice to have tool, CDPs. These exist to pull together every piece of data of your business and assign them all to a single unified profile. Um, and the key there, of course, is data sources. So can you bring in data from your ESP, those clicks, those opens, those manual data pieces you already shared? Um, can you bring in data from online survey tools, webinars, any shop vendors, you know, if you use a Square or a Stripe? Um, and the gold standard, of course, is going to be not just conversion and browse data from your business, but real-time conversion and browse data. If you can get that connected with your email program, there is no limit to what you can do. And to get there, you're, of course, going to have to get buy-in, um, get the cash money from your leadership. That can be the hardest part for a lot of us. You know, we know what we want to do. We know how to get there. It's just a question of convincing others. So the key here for your leadership is going to be to run pilots. Start as small and as manual as you have the resources to do today and make sure you're tracking those results. Always, always, always include a testing cohort with that and strategy. Um, definitely watch the session about testing, read up on it if you're not confident in your AP strategy. Um, and that will give you really clear return on investment on why we should do this. Make sure when you're asking for different tools and resources, you're also including time savings in that ROI. 
So maybe your campaign with product recommendations had you know, a 10% uplift in purchases. That's great. But is the tool you're asking for also going to save you 10 labor hours per month? You know, can you tell them that as the company grows, we won't need that extra headcount so soon because we have this tool? Or we can launch these X, Y, and Z similar campaigns at the same time because of this tool. Um, it's not just the direct return. Um, and I also find it helpful and persuasive to be forward thinking when you're proposing these new tools and funding. So say, you know, we can do this small campaign now manually. Given this budget and this tool, we can have you know, some of the algorithmic learning. So we can have our data feed of products connected. We can make sure they're automatically served. But once we get that fully on board, by the time we're ready for it, this product will absolutely have AI tools we can use. You know, a year from now, we'll already be set up because of the investment you're making today. That's always key to include. Um, and then it's also really important to get buy-in from your user base for personalization. Um, you know, we're always looking to be helpful, not creepy. That is the fine line marketers walk every day. And it's really helpful to acknowledge personalization. You know, those 71% of users who want personalization, they know that they're providing data to get it. So don't be afraid to say, hey, Sadie, we think you'll like these purple beans because we've noticed that interesting varietals are really important to you. And we see that you love to have a colorful spread at the market. And when they see the value of providing that data, they'll be excited to share more with you. So provide additional input areas, not just at account creation or those first touch points, but pretty often, you know, send regular surveys, have some additional questions when you have webinar registrations or white paper downloads, um, or just shoot them a quick yes, no in the email. And then finally, get granular with campaigns. The whole perk of personalization for users is that everything you send is going to be more valuable, and so you need to send less. Um, I think we would all love to get fewer emails and texts and still have the same value in our lives. So what is the absolute minimum you can communicate and still add that value? Get out of their hair because you were so good at your job. And so this is just such a huge topic and I could talk for hours, but I won't. Um, I do wanna leave you with some professional development resources that I love. For personalization, absolutely, but beyond. Um, I hope that you all, as email marketers, have gotten to experience that this is like a very interesting niche job. Um, and with that, we've grown a pretty cool community. So, you know, there's like the Email Geeks group on Slack, your ESP and ESPs like it might have blogs as well as open forum communities. Collaborate with those folks, share your ideas, ask questions. We all learn from each other a lot. Um, and then also work within the community of your own company. You know, reach out cross-functionally to your product tech operations group, whatever that looks like at your company, and work from a standpoint of ideas and strategies before you rush to the nitty-gritty of execution. Um, and also keep an eye out for inspiration. I saw it mentioned earlier in the chat. It's on my slide, too. Reallygoodemails.com is a great place to keep an eye on what folks are doing. These are users submitting their own things they're proud of. Um, and also keep an eye on newsletters. My work inbox is chock-a-block full of newsletters from brands that I, as a personal consumer, love because I, I know the data I provided to them. I can see how that's reflected. You know, when you combine something like identity-based personalization and behavior-based, that's how you get a Spotify wrapped. So keep an eye on those things and remember how you can do that for your own selves. Um, and then finally, just communicate as much as possible with your users, as much as they'll tolerate you reaching out, try and actually speak with them, get those surveys um, and understand what they want and need. And so speaking of, um, I believe we have time for questions. I would love to know what y'all want and need to know about personalization and starting from zero. Thank you, Emily. I totally agree with the importance of personalization. Uh, a few hours ago, uh, I myself was uh, talking about this. We uh, did an AI uh, test case uh, with product, uh, personalized product emails. And 
like money wise they worked times better than the usual uh, usual emails so but if i am a small company for example and this um, presentation you uh, presented to us uh, has like a really good list of what to do but it, it's too much maybe for me i am a man and a dog company <laughs> i don't know which one of us is which but <laughs> in your opinion what is the most important thing i should start with um i would definitely recommend going right in order if you are truly starting from zero and have nothing make sure that your brand's values and voice are reflected first so that's personalization that's going to go out to every single user because you're building the relationship and then from there you can begin to ask your users for information you need that initial trust at first otherwise you're just shouting into the void okay but um, still uh, i'm getting somewhere and i need help uh, a lot of ai tools uh, have <laughs> surfaced uh, uh, is it okay or do you know maybe some tips or tricks where i can utilize some kind of i don't know chat gpt to help me like put together uh, let me tell you uh, we are on the, on the other side of the table usually the client is on the uh, in front of us so if um, we approach a client and um, they say that oh i want all those things i want personalization i know that it works uh, and we don't get any input from them. They don't know how to tell us like the specifics of their unique company, and we don't know where to go from there. And for like a small business that I might be, it, it might also be like really hard for me to think of all those things like from scratch from zero. So maybe I can just write the chat GPT, please help me, <laughs> tell me something <laughs> about my company, read my, <laughs> read through my webpage and, uh, and uh, here is uh, Emily's uh, presentation and tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, that's a great starting point. And once you've got ChatGP familiar with what the company is, I have found it to be a super powerful, very free tool for crafting personas. So let's say you don't have the resources either as yourself or a company you're working with won't grant you access to actually reach out to users, you can say, you know, my product is XYZ. Tell me what you think are the five most likely user types and tell me the problem that I'm solving from them. If you can get specific with those prompts, you can build the different segments in your audience and fine tune from there through your A-B testing. You can say, okay, this is actually only 10% of my audience. Let's focus on these bigger personas. Okay. Okay. But uh, have you seen in your practice, uh, about um, like too much personalization, like creepy kind of personalization that I know so much information about my clients and I use it for uh, my personalization uh, like uh, in programs. Uh, and they start to think, why, why, why am I doing this? <laughs> and maybe this uh, is like a counterproductive some, somewhat. Yeah. How much is too much? Um it's too much if it's not adding any value and if you're not comfortable telling them where you got the information. Okay. So, you know, telling one of your clients what the weather is in their neighborhood, probably not valuable for your business model. And if you're not comfortable telling them that you got it because you scraped their IP, definitely stay away from that. Um, <laughs> and I would encourage you to work with your tech teams if you have that sort of resource. And to have those guardrails from the beginning. So only even ingest data that you know you can be transparent about and will be useful. Because sometimes we do get a little too excited, a little too, ooh, that's shiny. Um, mm -hmm. So take in the data that you only need. Yeah, I always remember then this uh, creepy thing from UK when the, they said this, that, uh, all right, you will get baby soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone sent an email. I, I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly yeah, that, that, that you were pregnant, but it was uh, in in America, I think. It was in UK. Target it, it or was Walmart UK. or something like yeah. that. <laughs> and yeah, the I remember that. That's yeah. why I personally prefer to stick to just zero and first party data. I know that there are cookies that will follow you everywhere, um, especially in the United States. We're not great about that. Um, <laughs> but I recommend against using it. 
Okay, yeah, in the European Union, it's probably a little bit better because we have <laughs> to like consent it to everything. But uh, but, but I how, think how it's how actually not, not in, there in the states all those you have this uh, can spam. Is it uh, and are you a little bit uh, know about our GDPR? How big is the difference actually between them? So, yeah, our closest um, version of GDPR is the CCPA. That's the California, I'm going to butcher this, Consumer Privacy Act or similar. And so that has a lot of the same requirements about, you know, needing to give consent for data, right to be forgotten. It's really similar. They modeled it off of GDPR. Okay. Um, and so we do have the nice perk that a lot of US-based companies, because they're likely to do business in California, have just adopted it. Um, it's not a state-by-state -state requirement, but most marketers who are trying to stay ahead of the industry will always plan for the future. So a lot of us, you know, a couple of years before GDPR was official, were planning toward that, even if we were based in the US, even if we were in a state that wasn't famous for its privacy. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Thanks so Thanks much.